This is FX Radio, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. With me on the line today is Dr. Paul Bird. Paul Bird originally studied nursing, then continued on to do medicine, completing his studies at Newcastle Uni with honours in 1992. After this, he went further to complete a PhD in imaging as a predictor of the outcome in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and hence took his place in the speciality of rheumatology. In addition to running two busy clinical practices, he maintains an active interest in teaching and research, and since 2004, he has maintained the position of conjoint senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales, teaching and examining medical students and postgraduates. Welcome, Dr. Paul Bird. Thank you. Paul, you originally studied nursing, which I did. Um, mm -hmm. What led you to advance to medicine and then further your career in rheumatology? Well, I studied uh, nursing back in the 1980s, which seems forever ago now, <laughs> but um, it was through the hospital system. Uh, so I left school and I wanted to do something in the medical field, uh, but I also didn't want to go to university full-time just at that stage. So nursing offered a, a great way to have an introduction to caring for people uh, but without having to study full-time at university. So I, I completed my nursing training and then did a year um, after I had finished that uh, as an emergency nurse um, at that time, however, nursing, or, or I guess nursing uh, careers were limited. Um, it was the, the late 1980s, and a lot of the, the um, advantages of the postgraduate course which were available now weren't available then. And I decided then it was time to go back and study full-time and further my career in medicine. So I was lucky to gain a position at the University of Newcastle mm. and then went on from there. Uh, as so often happens with uh, decisions in in careers, you know, a door opens and you sort of walk through. I didn't have a firm plan that I was going to rheumatology when I began, but it was one of those things that uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, mentored by some very good physicians who are rheumatologists and, and therefore moved in that direction. You were lucky enough to join the University of Newcastle, which at that stage was quite innovative in its uh, medical degree. Yes, it was. We often talk about the green box. We had a problem, uh, problem-based approach, which was, which was, uh, I think, for someone like me who'd already done uh, some medical training. I mean, I found it very stimulating. I think it was daunting for those people who perhaps were straight from school. But we were usually presented with a problem, and inside a green box were tools we needed to complete that problem. And along the way, we'd learn uh, different aspects of anatomy and physiology and biochemistry. So it was a great way to learn around a problem. Um, and, uh, I mean, I think we, we gained a lot of that. And certainly they always used to talk about this spiral approach that you'd learn a bit on the bottom spiral, more on the next and more on the next. So mm. you build up your knowledge as you, as you went along. I mean, I, I found it a very good way to learn. Mm. Mm. And so tell me about your, your foray into rheumatology. What sparked the interest? Uh, I think I... I, I was making a decision whether I'd do anaesthetics or physician training initially and then as always I, I think for me mentors are the thing and so I was mentored under a, a really good physician in Newcastle called Jack Fowler who was a, one of these old style physicians but was really good at managing patients and families and, and looking after medical conditions and then I was lucky enough to go and do time at the Royal Newcastle Hospital which was still away, still uh, standing then, mm. it's been knocked down mm. since uh, with team up the Garble Major and, and Siva Ratnaraja, a bunch of rheumatologists who were really innovative and, and really good at teaching. And I became interested. In, and at that time, rheumatology was just starting to get a lot of the new compounds available to treat rheumatic conditions. So it was a very exciting area. And it gave me that nice mix of, uh, I mean, it's a very person-based specialty. I mean, we, we, a lot of our treatment of people is talking, listening, getting the story so it's if you don't like people then you, you really shouldn't do rheumatology mm -hmm. but then also that exciting component of um of all the exciting new things that were happening so it seemed pretty clear after a while that i should move in that direction and it's a, a obviously a vast speciality and we're going to hone in on something but you mentioned um something that's key to it and that is the family um component of this and that's with fibromyalgia 
But there's been a, a lot of, uh, of evolution of the term of fibromyalgia. What was happening back then? F uh, fibromyalgia, I think, look, sadly, I, I think 20 years ago, uh, people with fibromyalgia were viewed as people who were just significantly depressed and anxious, and uh, they were often written off. Mm. Uh, as people who just needed antidepressants, mm. sadly. Mm. Uh, and our understanding in the last 20 years is, and even the last 10 years has moved ahead at leaps and bounds. We understand that it's a, it's a chemical imbalance. We understand that the, the thalamus in the brain of people with fibromyalgia behaves differently uh, to other people. Uh, we understand that a lot of the manifestations that people with fibromyalgia have are due to an imbalance that we hope we'll understand better as time goes on. I mean, right now we call it a chemical imbalance. Mm. We can't really measure that. Um, but uh, some very nice work in the United States has shown that uh, on functional MRI, um, the brain of people with fibromyalgia is certainly different and relax, reacts differently to stimuli. Mm. So that, that brings us to the, you know, this, this understanding now we have of fibromyalgia as a very complex multifaceted disorder. And perhaps in the future, fibromyalgia will be compartmentalised down into five or six different disorders mm -hmm. uh, as, as it evolves. And so how do these patients present in your practice? You know, what are the confounding issues that you see? And well, Generally, the, by the time they come to see me, uh, they've generally got quite severe symptoms and they, they have taken steps to try and remedy those symptoms, but th those things haven't worked. So they've used over-the-counter medications or they've tried to exercise or they simply haven't been able to understand is what, what is wrong with them. And that's one of the, the big confounding issues is, is helping people to understand what's going on. But they usually present with... Uh, I, I, li I like to talk to them about the three pillars uh, that, that underpin most of the symptoms. And they are disorders of sleep leading to fatigue. These people generally sleep poorly mm -hmm. and are tired most of the time. There's pain and particularly allodynia, which is the, the sensation of pressure or pain when on normal pressure, which distinguishes this condition a little bit from chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. And then there's a mood disorder. So many people have uh, depression or anxiety and any one patient can have a predominance of one of those three pillars, which then lead on to all the other things that go with fibromyalgia, the irritable bowel, the, the headaches and all the other things that people experience. So you mentioned that, you know, often these people have um, investigated previous treatments. So by the time they come to you, what's the normal time lag, if you like, from the presentation of their symptoms? Are you talking one year, five years? To be honest with you, by the time they see me, most people have had symptoms for at least five years, yep. many for 20 years. Wow. Um, and, you know, they'll... They may not have been severe initially, and they've been, but they, for example, they may have had symptoms for, for 25 years and may have been able to manage them with exercise when they were younger, but as they get older and uh, they haven't got time or other problems stop them from exercising, they can't manage the symptoms as they did previously. But often with people with fibromyalgia, you can search back and, and find a history dating back uh, decades. So take us through the general treatments for fibromyalgia patients because there's something I want to get onto a little bit later. It's quite uh, unique with what you're doing and that's investigating nutritional supplementation. But what, what's a, what are the general medical treatments with uh, FM patients? So the, the first is, is uh, we look at exercise. It seems to be one of the most important things and yeah. it needs to be aerobic exercise, three to four times per week of aerobic exercise. So... You know, that's one of the important things for people. The, 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 the thing is they often feel so rotten that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do often is bounce them out of the hole, as we call it, to get them out of that feeling so bad that they can actually start doing those things, and that's where medication fits in. Yeah. So exercise is important. Weight loss is important, and weight control is important. And again, often they feel so rotten that they can't do much about that until you help them feel better and they can, they can focus on it. Diet, um, always important. Uh, I, I don't recommend specific dietary interventions for people because it's difficult to get a general recommendation. A as you are aware, different diets work for different people. Mm -hmm. Some people will find if they take out uh, wheat, they take out dairy, if they reduce sulfites, they will feel better. But it's not a one-fits-all. So when I'm talking to people about diet, we generally talk about the principles of a healthy diet and then if they find something that really upsets them within the diet, then we might focus on how to eliminate that. Yeah. 
So they're the non-pharmacological methods uh, that we, we sort of use. Um, the, the other principle underpinning all of that is getting the person to understand what is wrong mm -hmm. and getting their family members to understand what is wrong mm, great. And, and getting them involved in the process. So I often encourage, usually women have the disorder and encourage them to bring their, their partner, their husband, their sons very often need to come in as well, especially if they've got teenage mm. sons, just to understand that on, on, there are days where uh, your mother, your spouse, your partner is going to look absolutely fine, but they're going to feel dreadful. And there'll be no rhyme or reason to that, and you've just got to go with it. That's a key for this uh, condition, isn't it? They look fine. They look fine. Mm. Uh, and that's the really important thing, is getting people around them to understand that and getting them to control the disorder rather than it controlling them. So that, they're the sort of non-pharmacologic principles. And then often, many, much of the first consultation, second or even third, is about understanding that. And often there's a sense of relief when they realise, OK, I've got something that is recognised. I'm not going crazy. Um, mm. I've actually got a, a recognised disorder here. And then we can start talking usually about management. Now, by the time people get to see me, usually they will need pharmacologic intervention because they're usually at a level where their symptoms are so severe that the short-term to medium-term uh, pharmacology is required to get them, uh, get them functional so they can undertake all those uh, activities we've just discussed, diet, exercise, yep. weight loss. Yep. And, and that's where we, we come back to this pain, sleep and mood. When we're assessing therapies, and we might use uh, tricyclic antidepressants in low dose or agents such as pregabalin, or uh, traditional antidepressants such as Lexapro, if mood is the predominant disorder, what I'm always trying to get people to focus on is pain, sleep, mood. What's better? What's not? How do we work to get those three pillars better? And so you're investigating something, though, that's pretty unique, and I've got to say, as a medical specialist, which is the pillar of orthodoxy, you're investigating the use of nutritional supplementation in fibromyalgic patients. Well, that's right, because I think we recognise that the, the people who see us as medical specialists are really the thin end of the wedge. Those people who see us, uh, those people whose symptoms have got so severe that they've in, in the end gone to their doctor and said, look, nothing's working, I, you know, I want to see a specialist or I need to see a specialist. But there are, it's well recognised there's a whole group of people out there who have mild symptoms or they might have mild to moderate symptoms and would benefit from not seeing a specialist and, and, and pharmacological intervention, but they benefit from exercise, diet and a nutritional supplement to do some of the things that pharmacology does in the severe cases, but we think can achieve uh, in the people who've got more mild to moderate disease. Paul, one of the historical orthomolecular approaches of the 1980s era was a super high dose supplementation with the hope of forcing a biochemical change in fibromyalgia symptoms. But your approach is different. What do you use now, though? There was, there was a period where... Um, I mean, I mean, if you look at some of the research done, things like low-dose naltrexone and those sort of things, and they certainly might have some benefit. There was a time where it was felt that high-dose vitamin C, high-dose vitamins um, or nutri supplementation could force that chemical change. The problem is I, I think the evidence for that has not been as strong as as hoped and I think the success rate wasn't as high as hoped mm -hmm. so again it had a very individual effect some people uh, could give a testimonial saying yes but nine out of ten people would say well I don't think it worked very well and one of the things we did with this compound was really go to the literature and say okay well let's find things that have reasonable levels of evidence let's look at the pain sleep the, the mood and, and, and look at those and where is the evidence in the literature? Mm. And that was my initial search mm -hmm. and then Bioceuticals took that search further and then we began to formulate the compound based upon what we felt had the best evidence. And so rather than um, just using something uh, in a shotgun fashion just to say, okay, well, maybe if we, if we use this, we've used a, a, a scientific approach to really find evidence uh, for the things that work best. Now, that evidence is not uh, randomised, controlled, trialled, highest level of evidence, mm. but it's very difficult to find that evidence in, uh, in these sort of compounds. So I believe it's, uh, it's reasonable evidence um, and it, it forms a, a good grounding 
for the, the compounds that have been placed into this product. Hmm. When you're using this nutritional supplementation approach, um, and I must stress as an adjunct to medical treatment, what sort of compliance issues do you have when using a supplement which isn't a one-a-day medicine compared to you know, your NSAIDs and things like that, which are quite strong medicines and yeah. they might be taking three or four yeah. of them a day? Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting thing, compliance. We often talk about this in rheumatology. Uh, compliance, for example, when you're taking an antihypertensive medication is difficult because you don't feel any better or worse mm. when you're taking it. Mm. it. You're simply being measured. You're, you're, the doctor is measuring something that will reduce, reduce the risk of stroke if reduced to a, a, a good level. Now, in rheumatology, we're dealing with symptoms. So compliance is often not a huge issue. If mm. someone feels better taking two a day, they will take two a day. Yeah. If someone feels better taking one a day, they will take one a day. So they will tend to um, be compliant because they get a result. So in the, the, the case of fibro care where we've got a one three times a day or sometimes they use it twice a day, compliance uh, does not seem to be an issue if the person is getting the desired effect. Mm. Of course, if they're not getting a desired effect, then... Uh, you know, they shouldn't be taking no, it and, cease, yeah. uh, and they'll cease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so do you find any glaring interactions with commonly used medications such as NSAIDs? Or uh, can I ask, do you ever use mm. some uh, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs in fibromyalgia? Is that appropriate? No, no, mm. it's not appropriate because mm. they don't. Uh, fibromyalgia, as far as we know, is not an immune-based phenomenon, as mm. far as we know, and mm -hmm. I stress that because... As I said, in 10 years, we may be re-examining how we think about this condition mm -hmm. and it may be subdivided into, you know, five or six categories. But at the moment, there's no evidence that using agents such as methotrexate or any of the agents that we would use for uh, inflammatory uh, conditions would be useful. So yeah. the, the risk would outweigh the benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of the question you asked about interactions, I think because the product contains a SAMI, yep. uh, there certainly can be interactions with... Uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors that people may be taking for uh, depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so people should always be warned about that, that they may experience agitation. If they do, they should, they should stop the drug. And, of course, if people are taking warfarin or those sort of anticoagulant medications, uh, I always warn them they should have their INR checked uh, regularly in the first couple of weeks after starting the medication. But there are general principles. Uh, they're, they're not um, uh, to this uh, I mean, to this moment, observed problems there, but they're potential interactions. Yeah. And so moving on to clinical effects. So, you know, you're saying that it works for some, not for others, and I guess that's mm. true of any nutritional supplementation. Um, Correct. Tell me what you see. Uh, when it's used, I usually pick the person. So I, I do see people with mild to moderate symptoms, uh, which may be uh, occurring as part of their non-primary presentation. What I mean is they'll present with a, a, a knee that's sore or they'll present with a, a back problem but will identify along the course of things that they do have fibromyalgia. And then they might have mild to moderate. And what I see is when people take the medication, the first effect is an increase in energy. So fatigue seems to drop first. Mm -hmm. That seems to occur fairly quickly. Um, then there seems to be a beneficial effect on mood which occurs and pain comes last, a reduction in pain. I find a lot of the effects on uh, energy and mood um, often are sufficient for people to be satisfied where they are and to get on with their exercise and other things they need to do. Yeah. So from my point of view, if it does those first two, it's getting people along the road to uh, helping self-manage. And when you're talking about exercise recommendations, are we talking mild to moderate aerobic exercise or are we, are we you know, telling them to really push themselves or, or do you let them well, decide? Uh, usually I say to them, look, if you're, depending on what they're going to do, so if they've got, so if they're going to do aqua aerobics or they're going to do walking or whatever they're going to do, it has to be slightly out of shorter breath, slightly shorter breath pace. Yep. And most people get that, that they've got to get to a level where they're not, not absolutely comfortable, mm. uh, and they're exercising so that they potentially release, um, um, the, the proposed chemicals, uh, that then help, uh, to make people feel better post-exercise yeah. and there's reasonable evidence for that so yeah it's um i usually tailor it to the person uh, depending on whether they've got other joint problems and give them firm recommendations about aerobic exercise so give them enough exercise to make sure they know that they're exercising but not enough to give them de um uh, delayed onset muscle soreness 
exactly <laughs> right. Yes. And do you it's find a fine any, line sometimes? Yeah. And do you find any limitations with a, a personality type that these people tend to go bullet a gate because they've been so rotten for so long, they want to get yep. stuff done and then they fall in a heap again? Yes, you've absolutely got to be careful. There are some people who uh, they do; they just want to get better. They've made a decision that they're going to get better, and so they will. They will. Uh, they they will go so. They're often very driven people, mm. and they will they will drive hard and do themselves harm. So, in those people, really firm recommendations about time, about what they should be doing. You know, treadmill, bike, whatever it's going to be, yeah. does help to just keep a, a, a bridle on on that uh, enthusiasm. And just lastly, I, I want to just uh, touch on the, the syndrome, if you like, the sickness syndrome or sick patient mm. syndrome. Because these mm. people often, as you say, they've been so rotten for so long, they fall into that, I'm sick, therefore I'm sick all the time, please be my saviour. How yeah. do you, as you use the words, bounce them out of the hole? W- what do you say? What do you do? Well, the big thing I get them to understand is that this condition is never going to put them in a wheelchair nor reduce their life, and it is controllable. Mm. And that control is about what they do. So if they get the understanding that they can control it rather than it controlling them, then they get a sense that they can get back control of their life. And so they stop being, stop feeling, they're not being, they stop feeling as though they're um, subject to the whims of how the fibromyalgia will behave and the symptoms will behave, and they're more in control of what's happening. And that's, that sort of empowerment is, is good in a number of levels. Firstly, it gives them hope they can get better. Secondly, it moves a lot of the, 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 the onus or the responsibility for getting better to them, with my help, of course. Mm. But also, they're not relying on me as their, their sole provider to, to get better, uh, which would be a mistake to say, well, I can do it all and I will get you better. The, the important thing is that they understand that they're going, as I always say to them, you're going to do most of this, but I'm going to be here to help you along the way. And do you enlist the aid of uh, fibromyalgia support groups at all? Are they still around? I, I do. You have to be careful, I think, because um, unfortunately, uh, many fibromyalgia support groups uh, contain very good people who want to do the best. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, they're often people who are chronic sufferers and so the perspective that they give people who come to those groups is one of chronic suffering yeah. and long-term disease, which is not the perspective that we really want to give to people. As I say, the people in those support groups, they are doing a great job and they're, they're trying to uh, give people the feeling of support, but sometimes it can work against mm. a person newly diagnosed. So, no, I don't encourage it uh, initially um, uh, because it's one of those things that's very hard to vet very hard to control the information yeah. being given. Just lastly, Paul, I know you've, you've basically done this, but take us through in one short, sharp spurt, if you like, a textbook, and I know they don't exist, a yeah. protocol of treatment of diet, lifestyle, exercise, medication, supplements, mm-hmm. etc. Okay, so say so we take a person who presents, it's usually a, a lady or a female who'll be in their, their 40s to, to 60s, often very busy, often uh, with children, a job, managing a lot of things. So it's almost like they're balancing this, this elephant on their shoulders and, mm. and then and trying to live life as well. So the thing that we, we really talk about in a nutshell is um, getting balance, taking control, taking time out for themselves to exercise, to look after their diet and look after their weight. So that the important thing first is to say to them, you, if, if you can do this, if you can take this time out, and this is important for you, then, uh, then we're going to have a much more successful program. And then we move on fairly quickly to therapy because, as I said, and what I've got to do now in short term is get you out of the hole, and once you're out of the hole, we can get you off medication. So we'll usually start fairly quickly on medication, move through that medication to find the right one that works, that gets control of those three problem areas the best we can, and then get that person going with exercise and focusing on themselves. And... And most people will have a positive outcome. Many will get off medication um, once they've been able to, to get going. Dr. Paul Bird, you've given us some great clinical tips to take back to integrate into our practice in what is traditionally thought of as a quite a complex and uh, confounding condition in these patients. So thank you so much for taking us through all that you have today. It's a pleasure. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This is FX Radio. 